Hello and welcome to the show. My guest today is an award-winning architect who's made a name for himself with his unique sustainable architecture. Diabedo Francis Quere is originally from Burkina Faso, but now has his own architectural practice here in Berlin with various projects underway in different countries around the globe. Welcome to the show. And you've just, you've just flown in, I think, from Venice, haven't you? Where... Yes. Yeah? Yes. But I want to start, we will talk about your architecture and how extraordinary it is um, coming up, but I want to start sort of at the beginning in Burkina Faso as a young boy, son, I think, eldest son of the village chief, and, and at the age of seven... Yes, that is you true. You had to leave the village to go to school yes. elsewhere. I mean, that must have been tough. Yes, but there's so how you have to do in Burkina Faso when you're born in a country where there is not enough schools, you have to move your family to be able to attend education. I did it simply when I was seven. Mm -hmm. I was forced to leave my family, my, my parents, my friends, and my community. Yeah. We should explain where Burkina Faso is because it's <clears throat> in West Africa, and to the north is Mali, am I right? Yes. Uh, and you tell us yeah. the rest. <laughs> so and Burkina Faso is simply surrounded by Mali, yeah. Ivory Coast, uh, uh, Ghana, Togo, Benin and Niger. And it's a landlocked country. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And did you have then all your education away from home? Oh, yes. Uh, and were you, with, were, were you with another member of the family? No, I, I, so... I, did you, I mean, you left your mum and dad, but yes. were you... I thought you were with an uncle somewhere or... or yeah, with a relative. After the, you. Yes. Uh, so I, I leave my family to, to be able to attend primary ed education. It was in Tenkodo. It's a city somehow 20 kilometres from the, my home village, far. Mm -hmm. And that for, or for this reason, I had to live in a, in a house of a relative yeah. far away from mm -hmm. my family. And then, I mean, almost, uh, this is moving on a few years, uh, you came to Germany. Was that your first time abroad, actually? Oh, yes. Yes. What was that like, coming yes. to Germany? It must have been yeah. quite an experience. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an experience I don't want to miss. And uh, it is still fresh. So imagine you take a plane, a flight from Burkina Faso, to Cap from Ouagadougou, the capital city of Burkina Faso, you just take off and you fly and fly and then realize that trees are coming. It's getting uh, greener and greener and you land to the Ivory Coast and you take there another flight to Nigeria, from there to London and then to Germany. It was amazing, mm -hmm. really amazing. I spent the entire flight time watching down until I had uh, uh, weeks later uh, headaches and everything, so... <laughs> yeah, and that was just the arrival. The trees were the yeah. big thing. I mean, you were coming, actually, I think, to be a carp to learn carpentry. That is true, So, yeah. So, and, and how did... Uh, that, where was that? That was at the, the, the Technische University here? No, 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 oh, no, no, no. I was going to say... I just came to Germany because I, I got a scholarship to be... to attend a, um, um, a training as a development activist in carpentry, but you imagine there is no wood in Burkina Faso. But that's what I was coming to. <laughs> I was going to say, a carpenter from Burkina you know, there's not a lot of trees. No, there is uh, not, not a lot of trees, on. no wood, uh, and carpentry is very primitive, so we have no wood, mm. simply. Mm. But in fact, coming to Germany was a chance to escape, you know, to move from Burkina Faso where everything is limited. There is no way to attend full day education. So I was simply lucky to get this scholarship to escape my environment and to enter another environment where everything seemed to be available and possible. And here you were yeah. in Berlin. Yes. How did the change come to architecture then? Ah, <clears throat> so as a kid in Burkina Faso, I've been working very hard. Part of this job was about going to collect buildings material and to fix housing of my relative in whom house I was living in the, when I was going to primary school in Burkina Faso. And I think as a kid, 
I wanted to do things better when I become adult. So that is why I had always this, this um, wish to, to, to learn how to build, to make better housing. This is simply that one reason. Another reason was sitting in a classroom in Burkina Faso with more than 150 other kids. So in a little room, let me say uh, less than 50 square meter. So um, I was always dreaming and uh, so, so was hot in this building. So I was dreaming to make things there better also. So I wanted to build mm -hmm. better classes. I, I think those things came together and this is how I started to study architecture. Yeah, but here you were in Berlin yeah. doing carpentry. How did you manage to get into the technical university <laughs> where, I mean, I don't know about yeah. a, a few years ago, but today to study architecture there, there's, I don't know, let's say there's 100 kids yeah. for five places or 10 places. Yeah. No, but simply when I came to Berlin, I didn't have my uh, high school degree. Mm -hmm. You have to know that I had to go again back to school but this time in an evening school in Berlin, uh -huh. yes. And I made it for five years. In German? Yes. And that's how you learn German, I guess. Yes, yes. And it, at night, every day, except, with, except to Saturday and Sunday, I went to a school mm -hmm. from 6 o'clock p.m. to 11 o'clock p.m. to be able to, to do my high school degree and then to go to Berlin. Uh, to, to the TU to study architecture. Okay, uh, we're it's talking great. about yeah. schools. I mean, let's have a look at some of the extraordinary buildings you've designed and a bit about your life also here in Berlin. Diebedorf Francis Carré left his homeland more than 20 years ago and he's been on the move ever since. He has architectural projects all over the world, but those closest to his heart are in his homeland, Burkina Faso. Kere works with simple materials, designing elegant, efficient buildings, using resources available locally. And he develops new ideas, like this double roof that allows the air to circulate and cost-efficiently cool the school. What I do is look to see what I can take from Germany to Burkina Faso, not transfer it one-to-one, -one, but translate it to suit the local needs. In that respect, I am building a bridge between Germany and Burkina Faso. Carré's biggest project is the opera village in Burkina Faso, a dream of the late artist Christoph Schlingensief, whose widow, Aino Labrens, is still working with Carré. His school, created from mud bricks, has won him global fame. It's necessary to create buildings that can get by without air conditioning or artificial ventilation. He left Burkina Faso so he could return. He wanted to find an architectural style suitable to his impoverished country in Western Africa. Now he's active around the world, redesigning an old military barracks in Mannheim and preparing a project for Beijing's Biennale. His office studio in Berlin is a multicultural laboratory and his second home. Here, okay, just to test it. Light uh, uh, penetration inside. Light will definitely go through, which is, uh, will be exciting. Here, Here in Berlin, I love the solitude that I can sometimes do something on my own, but Burkina Faso will always be my real home. Kere doesn't just want to copy architectural styles in Europe, but to observe and learn wherever he happens to be. The elementary school he built in Gundo is a model for all of Burkina Faso and won him the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. Next door, an airy library is under construction, again using local resources. Kade developed his own recipe for making bricks. Eight buckets of cement added to 92 buckets of clay. This mixture makes his buildings resistant to rain and termites. He learned to work with clay at an old brickwork factory in Germany. That's where I learned how they used to mix and sift the clay here. And I helped make the casts and learned how you get the clay out of the molds and roll it. And then bang, into the mold, scrape it flat and so on. It was wonderful. Germany streets have become as familiar to him as the dusty savannah. He likes a lot about Germany, but some things are still alien to him. 
Manchmal vermisse ich Sometimes I miss the spontaneity of life. But I always have that in Burkina. Das habe ich wiederum weiterhin in Burkina. In Gando, he's building houses for teachers and an extension of his school. He's determined that despite a minimum of resources and adverse conditions, he'll find a unique aesthetic for Africa. That's a promise he's made to his country. Diebedo Francis Carré, our guest today on Insight Germany. And we were talking before that report about how you managed to study architecture. How did you manage to set up a business in Berlin after you'd finished your architectural studies? Yeah. You know, that's quite tricky, isn't it? Setting up a business in... Yeah. No, but I just did things in parallel. While studying in Berlin, I started to think about how to build schools in my... a, a school in my own village in Gando. So you have to know that I built my very first project, a primary school in Gando, in my home village, when I st was still a student. I was studying and I just did it. And mm -hmm. I graduated uh, three years later. So, um, so I didn't have a plan to make a business or to, no, things just came for, from alone. Mm -hmm. So it was a sheer necessity that led me to build a school because when I leave my village, there was no school. And I, I guess, instead of bringing presents, I have a big family, you have to know that. Instead of bringing presents to my village, I just wanted to give something, to give education to my that's people. Quite, that, that's yeah. quite a big present. You, we'll come <laughs> to the school, and I want to talk a bit okay. in detail <clears throat> uh, about that. Just before that, though, you also said in that report, you love the solitude of Berlin. And that struck me because this, <laughs> how many million people are here? What's, where's the solitude? Oh yes, it's, so, of course, nowadays people knows me, know me, but you have to know that in this big, big city, you have time to go to, to retire yourself. You may be in, a, in yeah. public, but not everybody knows you. So, ah, and in Gando, in where Gando, you come from, he, yes, uh, uh, in Gando, I can't do nothing, or even in Burkina Faso, somehow people know me and mm. they just come. And in Gando, especially, especially if I am there, I have to act. People just came to speak, to discuss, to ask for uh, some advices, okay, so okay. to share, you know. And so, mm. in this context, being in Berlin, being able to go, for example, in a big cemetery, so which is green and quiet, uh, is. is are called okay. solitude. But when you uh, were initially in Gando and you started building the school, yeah. I believe the locals were actually a bit disappointed. <laughs> Didn't they expect sort of, I don't know, Guggenheim Museum steel and things? And there you were. This is what's extraordinary about your mm. architecture. You use local things. We saw making the bricks, for yeah. instance. Yes, well. How to build in a region like Burkina Faso, how to build uh, in a country which has a past, a colonial past, you know, with a, a Western country. So very simple. When I arrive home, uh, explaining to my people that I'm, I am here to build a school together with them, and I already have the money, you have to know that everybody was like over the moon. They was really happy. And mm. then I explained them that we are going to use clay to use math. So I have to say that they was shocked, really. They was really shocked. The rejection was so big. Nobody wanted to speak again with me. And it cost me a lot of energy and then discussions to convince them that this is the only way to do a, a school which respond the best to the clim climate and to our need. And that is it. But at the beginning was no, they was not open for that idea. No, no, mm. no. And uh, you gave us, you sent us some pictures, and <laughs> this one, to us most probably, understood, guys standing on a curve there. Yeah. But there's, there again, uh, if you look closely at the guys, they all look petrified. <laughs> yeah, this is a great story. Um, you know, the, the, the problem I have always, it is how to explain drawings and engineering to people who are neither able to read nor write. Uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah. What I do is to build a model, a mock-up, but a model, one by one. In this, ca in this case, was a um, was a, a piece of the roof structure. 
So we made it one by one out of clay bricks. And then I have to, I cannot jump, jump in this studio, but normally I jump on top of that structure yeah. so that my people understood that it is See, working. Yeah. It, will, it, it won't crash. Yeah. So that is uh, the test. Yeah. So to, to check the engineering. So that's how we, we build it. But this next one is the roof. You, now, yeah. this roof is meant to make it cooler. And it, this is not the locals in Burkina Faso. This is me. I see a steel roof. Yes. I know the temperatures in Burkina Faso. And yeah. I think of the sun beating down on that roof. Yeah. And it's got to be hotter underneath. Yeah. You, but it isn't. It isn't. This is a, a smart idea, you know, just to use the sun, the effect, the negative of effect of the sun to ventilate inside the classroom. So if you have a structure, you have a, uh, the metal sheet like this, and you open the roof and inside, down you have a massive skin made out of clay, of bricks. Okay. So you create a certain ventilation. You, you push the air to circulate between the two, two elements. It's that way, so the hot air inside the two elements is escaping from one side and absorbing the inside air. So it's very simple. Fresh air are coming from the side, through the windows. It is uh -huh. very simple, but it's, it really works. Yeah. I, and and another thing you, you're saying about using local materials, yeah. this picture also tells a story because there's lots of pots in Burkina Faso. We show that briefly, as we can see, uh, the women there bringing the pots. And then, if I can show another of your buildings, which has got the sort of pots cut up yes. on the top. And this is another form of vent ventilation. Yes. Or the same principle, perhaps, yes. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, the, the it, and that steel structure on top is the, is the roof before it's yes, yes. And I would have again said, of course, the sun beating down. But of course, it works with your theory. Yeah, it really works. You need to have the openings. You know, hot air is escaping always uh, on the top. Yeah. So you can't, if you if for example to to express it with Western word. You have to heat your, 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 your apartment. Uh, if you heat your apartment and the, the guy up to you is not heating his apartment, your energy is going through the, the ceiling and then heating, you have to heat his apartment. <laughs> so the hot air is escaping from the top. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I just use this principle, yeah. making openings in the ceiling, so just let the hot air escape. So you create a natural ventilation. Yeah. This has been extraordinarily um, successful in Gando. I mean, I now believe there are over 700 children being educated there when there weren't any being educated there when yeah. you were seven years old. Um, how did you get the teachers, though, as well? Because, of course, this is another side. There's nothing, in a way, to do with architecture, but you've got to get the teachers to mm -hmm. go to Gando. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you build a school, it, this is not enough. So you need teachers. What we do is to collaborate with the government. The government is sending teachers and pay them. So what I have to do is to provide infrastructure, such as uh, um, housing for them. Uh, a teacher is uh, an educated person in Burkina Faso, of course, mm. and he don't want to stay in a village. What we do is to provide them with very comfortable housing, so to attract them. Mm. So. Uh, so that is how we do. Uh, but for long term, you have to cooperate more with the teacher to improve also teaching. So uh, the electricity rate in Burkina Faso is high, but I think to go forward, you have to improve the quality of teaching. Uh, today in Gano, I am really proud to tell you that I was the first one to be able to read and write. <clears throat> uh, but we have more than as you, you, you could see, we have more than 700 kids. And they're all reading and writing. Yes, this is, yeah. this is a big step. And how, 
How was this financed as well? I mean, I know the the Schulbausteine for Gando yeah. in in German uh, translated would be building blocks for Gando. Was this money you gathered here in Germany? Were, 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 how did you finance mm. it? Yeah. So how I work, how I finance is very simple. Uh, here in Germany, I collect money from some friends, but at the beginning, I all I, I collected money from my my colleague at G, uh, 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 when I was studying. As you have to know that at that time I lost all of my friends because I came with a box, is a model of the school that I built myself and asking for support. Uh, fortunately, today, every, a lot of them j just admire how I worked, I, I could achieve this. Uh, but collecting the money is not enough. So you have to convince the community to work with you. So I'm using the little money that I could collect and then I convinced the people to be part of the, the, the building process so that together we can build great building for less money. So that is how I, mm. I, I do. So you see, you, if you are in Gando, you will see women with pots on their head walking to the site, to the building site. So everybody put his little stuff to get this thing happening. Mm, yeah. So it helps save money. And there is another uh, uh, um, aspect in this project that people don't know. It is education, even. Uh, the adult need education. We train the young people in the technique we apply to build the schools so they can't earn money. They become professionals working in different building sites mm. now. Mm. Uh, it, it runs from Burkina Faso, from Gando, to other cities, places in Burkina Faso, to the neighboring countries also, mm. Ghana, Togo, Benin. So you see, something That's is really happening. gathering more. Yes, places. exactly. Uh, there's, uh, Apart from the financial yeah. side, you also made friends or got the attention of a very famous uh, German artist who, who we must briefly talk about. Um, yeah. Because in the first report, it talked about an opera village. Yeah. And um, I was thinking of Fitzcarraldo, where, where Klaus Kinsey um, builds an opera in the Amazon jungle. Yeah. Um, this was because of a, a man called Christoph Schlingensief. Tell us about him. How did he get, how did you get involved or how did he get involved in your project? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, the Opera Village and Christoph Schlingensief. Um, unfortunately, uh, he's not alive anymore. He passed away um, in 2011. Uh, it was a, I, I, crazy is not a good word, but he was a, a genius, let me say that. He, has, he had a dream. He wanted to build an opera in Africa. And then our ways cross. So I was giving a lecture and leading a workshop in South, uh, South, South, uh, in, uh, in South Africa. And people connected us. And I got to meet him. And he had this dream. But to be honest, I am fighting to build schools in Burkina Faso. And somebody came with an idea to build an opera. You could imagine my reaction, yeah. my natural reaction. So, it's a provocation, it's not serious. So, I am struggling to build schools to educate people. You come with an idea of an opera. Uh, opera, even in the Western world, is something that is really limited to the, to the 2% of the population. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and then, but by the way, then uh, we happened to meet and he was so, a great person, he has a strong personality and he made this idea so attractive, so and we, yeah. st we start to do the project. Okay. Christoph Schlingensief was an extraordinary man. Let's have a, a look in a little more detail at the career of this rather controversial artist. <laughs> He's sorely missed. Few artists have had this said about them quite so often. Radical, iconoclastic. Performance artist and director Christoph Schlingensief. He died in 2010. Why do we miss him so much? Last year, an exhibition in Berlin was seeking an answer to this question. It was the first comprehensive Schlingensief retrospective. But how can a museum do justice to someone as multifaceted as he was? Schlingensief wasn't afraid of anything. He created theater, art, and opera, and made in-your-face splatter movies interwoven with German history. 
1998, he founded the political party Chance 2000, or in English, the Last Chance Party, which also staged this happening in Vienna. Schlingenzief's own version of the television show Big Brother, putting asylum seekers in containers. As always, many thought he was going too far. Chance 2000, a blend of politics, art, and play. Schlingensief issued a call for four million unemployed to take a dip in the Wolfgangsee Lake in Austria and raise the water level, thereby flooding German Chancellor Kohl's vacation home. Of course it failed, but Schlingensief's motto was, failure is opportunity. In 2003, he had unemployed people sit around and wait for posts. At the Berlin exhibition, students took on this job a pale copy of the original idea. Yet another provocation, his 2004 staging of Wagner's Parsifal in Bayreuth, a marathon of shock and salvation. A scandal was guaranteed. Wounds, myths, kitsch. The exhibition was a journey through German history. It also documented how Schlingensief lived with cancer, as in his project with the Venice Biennale, a church of fear of the stranger in me. Undeterred in 2008, he pulled out all the stops and founded what he called his opera village in Burkina Faso, complete with a hospital and a school. He continued writing, struggling and venting his anger and his fear. Brutally honest and still loud, but increasingly quiet. Christoph Schlingensief, a bit mad, a bit maniac, but always a maverick. A maverick, indeed, and um, the, uh, what is the state of affairs, actually, with the Opera Village? I know that uh, since he died, it's still going on. Yes. His widow's helping with the project, and, yes. and some celebrities as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, since he passed away, we keep doing the project. He, unfortunately, he couldn't see the project. So, but we opened uh, three years ago. So just in 2002, we opened the, uh, the first school building. Uh, now, 150 kids are attending uh, primary education in the, uh, in the, in the opera village. Mm, yeah. mm. So I know. What about the opera as yeah. such itself? <laughs> I mean, is, is it gonna, uh, have opera there, or is it going to uh, have something different? Yeah, uh, whatever. The opera itself uh, is still part of the project, the vision, uh, but it's not an opera uh, like you yeah. may imagine it should be. But uh, we have a space, we have this infrastructure where different activities are already happening on the site, uh, sometimes supported by the German, uh, uh, the Goethe Institute, the German cultural institution, oh, right. so that we make perf performances and then dancing, whatever. A lot of activities are happening there. Uh, but the most important thing is education is still happening. Uh, in two weeks, three weeks, we will open a nursery, which is part of it. Uh, Christoph himself once happened to say that a cry of a newborn is an opera. So maybe if all of this happening, uh, you may understand that it's not opera in the classical way. In, no, no. Uh, in the, an opera like you would imagine in Europe. So It's a performance space. Yes. And will uh, have all sorts of things, perhaps not La Boheme or something by Puccini. But Absolutely. We'll have all sorts of things. And, and backed by people like, um, I believe, the author Henning Mankell and yeah. Herbert Grönemeyer, the famous German singer. And th these people are still backing the project. Oh, yes, yeah? yes. We have a lot of uh, uh, friends that are supporting the project. Uh, um, the, German, the former German president, uh, Horst Köhler, is uh, protecting and supporting the project. Um, so, and then you have all of these uh, f uh, people that are supporting us financially. Uh, so to keep things go, but money is a problem. We have to say because it's a big, it's a huge project, and uh, I know the widow of Christoph is uh, struggling to find to, to find fund uh, to to get mm. the project go ahead. I'm still supporting the project with my architecture. I am the contact, and I am flying to Burkina to 
um, supervise the ongoing project and then the, the, the building that are in process. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's going. We've talked mainly about the projects in Burkina Faso. I'd like to, you've sent us a couple of other pictures, if you can <clears throat> tell us. This one's, is this in, one in China? Yes. And that, that, no, that's more <laughs> the, architect, the architecture that I would understand, or looks like it. Is yeah. this more conventional, if you like? Mm, yes, somehow. Uh, I got a chance to work with a, a great um, Chinese architect, Wang Shu. He's a good friend of mine. And I just asked him, you know, what these people expect from me? You know what I'm doing? I'm using mud, mostly, in Burkina to build schools. What can I do? What can I, uh, how can I contribute it? Uh, he just tell me, you know, keep doing open spaces like you do, and then you will know. And for myself, I have been to China to learn. It's really not the modern stuff. But China is so very old and has old techniques. I was interested in these old techniques. So that is mm -hmm. why I, I, land up, I end up to start a project in China. Mm -hmm. And this is another project or yeah. a, a architectural, well, it was an exhibition, wasn't it? Yes. In London, I believe. Yes. It's a great installation in London, in the Royal Academy of Art. So it has been successful. I don't know if you have more picture about that. I do, So I yeah. invited the public so to the participate, one. to contribute it, to, to build up this, uh, uh, oh, this I see. installation. This is the second picture. Yeah. Yes. And is that done by the public then? Yes. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Yes. Tell us. What, how, what? No, no, no. Simply because if you invite me to do something in London, mm. in Gando I will use much or something else. And in London, what is available in London? So I have realized that you have a lot of uh, honeycomb. It is hiding everywhere, in every furniture. I just wanted to expose this project, this material. So creating um, a tunnel and inviting the people inviting the visitor to contribute it, not to stand and just watch, but to be part of the... Of and they've got kind of sticks, yes, coloured sticks, sticks yes. and they can just they, put, yes. put it where they like? Yes. Oh, OK. It, it, I think it has been a, a big success, really, because yeah. people just queue to put their... Um, to contribute to build this um, structure. And are, and are you, uh, I mean, seeing that and the, uh, the, the pictures before, this was not like the pictures in Gando and using local material. This was using modern technology. Is that yes. the way you're going more now? Yeah, it's, no, it's about, if I am in London, I am in England, is uh, the, 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 the country of uh, modern technology, is the country of industrialization. So I may use industrial products to build there because this is the most av available product. Yeah. So, industrial product. So, in Gando, we use material, we use clay. This is the most building material. So, mm -hmm. somewhere else, I may use something different. So, yeah. if you talk about Geneva, where I have the chance to make the permanent uh, exhibition of the International Red Cross Museum using uh, hemp, you know, hemp. Yeah. Is yeah. known as uh, you use it in a, in a, in a, in a fabric. So, mm -hmm. but. Uh, you can use it to build. It's a very good insulation yeah. material. Yeah. Okay. You can use it to build. Oh. And another thing that architects are beginning to use is 3D printing. We'll see if our guest has used that in a minute. But they say that it's possible to print your own food. Why you want to do that is beyond me, but still. And now you can print your own house. And I, I wonder straight away what that's like to heat. But anyway, here's more. <laughs> This column has come out of the printer, and it's part of a 16 square meter room. More than two and a half meters high, it weighs 11 tons and is the latest innovation in the world of architecture. It's made of artificial sandstone, and it has ornamentation reminiscent of a Gothic cathedral. Michael Hansmeier and Benjamin Dillenburger from the Technical University in Zurich are the brains behind the creation, which they call the digital grotesque. We've seen it in the past, in the pre-modern pre days, um, that architecture was created with an incredible level of detail. If you look at Baroque churches, if you look at um, the Rococo and so on. But it took an incredible amount of time. It took artisans years and years and years um, to, to create something like this. 
They completed their room in just a few months, using an algorithm to calculate every angle and curve and to create shapes that possibly couldn't be done by hand. The 3D printer is indeed breaking new boundaries. Using the 3D printer, it takes just two days to apply the layers of fine sand. They are then stuck to the artificial stone. Once it has set, any excess sand is removed from the mold and can be reused. The team has assembled the component parts to make a solid walk-in room. Architects in Amsterdam are going a step further. On March 1st, they will begin the construction of the first printed building. It's a canal-side house made of plastic. A specially designed machine will print the component parts on site, and they will then be assembled in much the same way as a toy house. 3D printing, that's like speed and materials. At the moment, with the pace of growth in the, in the mega cities, the current construction techniques is not sufficient enough. And maybe that's why we also believe that 3D printing can actually uh, make a big difference in 5, 10, 20 years' time. Other European architects are also developing concepts for printed houses. The Amsterdam-based company Universe Architecture is planning what it calls a landscape house from artificial sandstone. Foster and partner are working with the European Space Agency to create a moon base that would be printed on site using moon sand. The London company Softkill Design has an equally innovative project. The structure of their building imitates bone growth. The artificial sandstone of the Zurich-based project is not strong enough yet to withstand wind and weather, but the architects are convinced that it's only a matter of time before it will be. And when it is, people will be able to live however they wish. Uh, my guest is Francis Carré, uh, the celebrated architect. Do you think people will be able to live however they like because of... This, so. I mean, you use a bit of 3D printing, but not on that scale. Yeah, uh, not, not in that size. It's, um, I, I may say this is a 3D printing help you if you have a model, which is uh, delicate to do if you want to have, to be more precise. Uh, yeah, some may be able to, pr to print, but it's not an, it's, it's a production principle or a process. It's a processes, you know, it's a new way of producting. It's like prefab. So if they use it, but it's much more precise, uh, I, I think that this will help solve a lot of problems. So increase the 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 the, uh, the speed to build. You know, yeah. if you are building okay. in a city, uh, yeah. So why not? We, we are in the twenty first century. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities. We have a lot of uh, possibilities. So it's good to to explore them. Yeah. yeah. Um, your next project, we haven't got pictures of because it's so new, the Leo Clinic. Mm -hmm. This is, you, you told me before we came on, this is sort of a bit more of a holistic approach, even more so than Gando. Yeah. yeah. Leo is a, a good example for us. So because all, everywhere, every time when I start a new project, I am trying to do something new, to explore something new. It might be a material, but it may be, uh, you know, energy. So in Leo, so you may imagine it very simple. We use clay. It is locally available to build a, um, the structure. And then we use solar panels to collect the sun energy, transform it into electricity, which is noun. Uh -huh. But uh, because we have no electricity, we have no power at, in, in, in Leo. Uh, in this site, and what we do is to collect the water, uh, grey water, whatever you use in this clinic, and to clean it using electricity that you have from uh, of, for free. You understand, and yeah. put it again yeah. in the circulars. So, okay, that that's one 
project. Yeah. I want to just briefly yeah. ask you about your project in Germany because you're doing a huge project in Mannheim as well. Oh, yes. You've, you've become the master of re well, reinventing barracks, you said. <laughs> <didn't you? laughs> no, maybe, maybe our, uh, our specialist of converting is better than uh, yeah. inventing. Uh, no, we got a, we was part of a competition team and uh, we, we, we won the competition. It's about Taylor Barracks, 46 hectares. Uh, it's wow. huge. That's huge. Yeah, it's That's huge. a big area. And then to, to we are making the master plan uh, where you have different uses, especially uh, especially um, industrial. So and that is what we're working on. And uh, the idea we had is to put green through this area that was closed for years, you know, yeah. and to give something back to the population. Uh, but the way keeping economical uh, uh, mm. expectation also. No, we, we, now we're working on that. We're working since two years. It, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a great project. Well, it's been, it's been fascinating talking about all sorts of different architecture that you're up to. I wish you all great luck. Before we go, I think we've just got about a minute, we have a, a questionnaire. We haven't had time to talk about it, but one of the things you put in it, if I remember rightly, is... Um, <laughs> One of the best things about living in Germany, I just found it interesting, was, was the weather. Yeah. It's, I thought you might have put that as one of the worst things about living in Germany. Know. The best but, thing is uh, the weather. So in Burkina Faso, you have dust. In Germany, you have no dust. No but, dust. You know, oh, it, okay. For sure, you don't have that much sun like as in Burkina, but you have no dust. Some, in some areas, you have no flies and mosquito. So this is... I mean, this is great. So do you quite like the winter then, in Germany? Oh, oh yes. I, I, I may say I am very difficult. I am, I, I, I love, I, I am sometimes controversial. Yeah. So I love winter. I love the calm, the quietness. Uh, yeah. I love I know, it. When the snow's on the ground. Yes. Francis, we have to leave it there. Francis yeah. Carré has been fascinating, really because I know nothing, I now know something about architecture and wonderful sustainable architecture. Thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please do so. Uh, write to insight at dw.de. If you want to know more about any of Francis's wonderful uh, things that he's doing, projects, um, we'll get back to you. Bye-bye now. <laughs> See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.